Uh, hey, hey, thank you, Vitalik. Thank you, John. Um, hey, I, I'm Asway. I currently uh, lead strategy at Flashbots, and I will talk to you about decentralizing sequences. Uh, wait, it's all PBS? Yeah. Uh, always has been. So, in this talk, um, I will convince you rollups are in the process of decentralizing their sequencer. So, every rollup um, has a decentralization roadmap, and all of these roadmaps have some plans for decentralizing the sequencer. However, these uh, the way that uh, sequencing works in layer two, it actually combines uh, what is the equivalent of a layer one proposer and a layer one block builder in the same role. And this creates a variety of problems unless we start to address it by separating these two roles on layer two, just like we did on layer one. In addition to that, even if we do PBS on layer two, um, there are novel challenges involved around privacy, cross-domain MEV, and um, lower latency than we are used to on layer one. And so we will get into these in the talk as well. Um, and uh, we will see PBS is essential, but it is in itself not enough. We also need to decentralize the builder role itself. So decentralizing rollup sequencers, what is a sequencer? Um, there are basically four steps involved. So as a user, you send your transactions to uh, a layer two sequencer who orders them according to some policy and then gives the user some receipt to the user. So Talik was talking about pre-confirmations that is step, step number three here. And then the sequencer sends the ordered batch to the DA layer, where it basically becomes finalized from the perspective of the layer two. So this particular diagram is taken from Starknet, but um, the above is how it works in pretty much every, um, every layer two. So there might be some small differences, for example, um, in, in Starknet A, the sequencer is also the prover, so they have even more responsibility, but um, all of these can be stripped out and would be stripped out over time. So why is decentralizing layer two sequencers important? Well, because as Vitalik was alluding to, because rollups are becoming more and more important and more and more um, volume and liquidity is moving over to these new execution layers. And um, I don't think we have even uh, started to imagine the end state of um, of how blockchains would scale, <clears throat> as we are kind of seeing with these different rollups, uh, rollup providers who are now n not even just focused on building their own rollups. No, they are focused on, they have all pivoted to kind of rollups as a service. And um, it's. Uh, I think it's quite possible that we will see a, a future where um, spinning up a new blockchain is is kind of, like spinning up a new smart contract today. And so we will have many rollups and these rollups all will have um, sequencers. So we'll have many sequencers. And today all of these sequencers are centralized and centralized sequencers um, can censor the user. They can go offline. They can charge arbitrary prices. They are regulatory choke point and they can see the user transaction before it gets confirmed. And they can do various things with this transaction that is hard to attribute. And so while one of have these great guarantees, so we can get always a transaction mined through the layer one and the sequencer cannot force an invalid state transition and so on, then it, there's still a lot of problems um, with them. And that's why we need to decentralize them. There are various proposals for how to decentralize sequencers. Um, one is uh, the layer one or quote unquote, other chain sequenced approach. So that includes the based sequencing that um, Vitalik was talking about. There are also other approaches, for example, around shared sequencing. So that's when one blockchain um, sequences many other blockchains. Um, so shout out to Espresso, for example, uh, who have put forward this vision. Um, you have the optimism style sequencer slash block auction um, where the right to uh, propose the next block or the next series of blocks um, is auctioned off every now and then. Um, and then uh, what Stark, uh, Starknet is planning, random selection from a proof of stake set. So in that case, you have, um, you have basically a consensus mechanism on top of your 
uh, of your rollup and um, a, a proposer is selected randomly and um, and they get to propose the block. This is very similar to how it works in, in the layer one. And then finally, you can have various committee-based solutions and the most common one would probably be uh, first come, first serve. Um, this is where a committee just looks at uh, what transaction um, the different nodes saw first and then come to some kind of consensus on that. And um, yes, yeah, we were saying already in the uh, in the summary, in the layer two right now, uh, what we understand as the term sequencer actually combines um, the equivalent of a layer one proposer and a layer one builder, um, especially in the leader election mechanism. So um, that is the proposer part. And then the ordering mechanism, that is the building part. And so if we go back to these different um, proposals that have been put forward. So um, they actually have different lead election mechanisms, different ordering mechanisms, but what I would like you to take away from this um, from this slide is only that the innovation that is inherent to these proposals is almost entirely in the leader election mechanism. So nobody has any credible plans about the ordering mechanism, right? So they are only focused on the leader election mechanism today. And that is a problem because if you do layer twos without proposer builder separation, then what you do, then you have the two roles bundled, like they used to be bundled in Ethereum layer one before MEV was a big deal. But now MEV is a big deal. And what would happen is you recreate the dynamics of pre PBS days from Ethereum layer one on these rollups. And what you get, you get priority gas auctions again, you get front running, you get failed transactions in a clocked up P2P layer from the search for strategies uh, who are being forced to compete in inefficient MEV auctions for um, uh, for the MEV. And because the auction is less efficient, you will also get a lower proposer revenue that leads to a threat of vertical integration between searchers and block builders. So all of these problems that we talked about two years ago on Ethereum, Boom, they are back now on layer two, making their comeback. And so that's why I would actually say, when we talk about decentralizing sequencer today, sequencer as a service, I think it would be more accurate to actually talk about proposer as a service because that's what it really is, right? It's, we are only looking at the proposer today. So we need to start separating these two roles on layer two, just like we did on layer one. Is a quick refresher for you what PBS actually does. So the effect that PBS has on Ethereum is it shields the proposer role from the centralizing effects of MEV by making the most valuable block available to all proposers equally. And you don't, whether it's a small solo validator or it's a big um, staking pool like Lido or Coinbase, they all make the same from MEV and that is a huge, huge achievement. It also unlocks competition on features from block builders that don't require any protocol changes to Ethereum. And this has created more privacy for bidders, more expressivity for bidders. And here I would particularly highlight the introduction of the bundle by Flashbots um, that decoupled the position of the transaction from the price. Because in the public mempool, you were only able to express basically these two dimensions uh, through a single unit, which which was the gas price. Um, the removal of neg negative externalities from the chain that were the result of these uh, these bad searcher strategies and um, maximizing revenue for the seller. And so we can see this map one-to-one -to, -one to the problems that we laid out earlier. Um, and PBS solves them all, which is amazing. So we need PBS and explicit MEV options to maximize protocol revenue and minimize negative externalities on these layer two networks and their users. But PBS on layer two also faces novel challenges that were not necessarily here when we designed PBS on, on layer one. So the big one, the, arguably the biggest one is privacy. So all of these centralized sequencers have 
gotten the user very addicted to the idea of quote unquote easy privacy, right? And um, now I think it's a very hard choice. Like, do you remove privacy when you decentralize the builder or do you try to decentralize it? I think both paths are very, very hard. And it's, it's not clear that either of them um, is necessarily better or easier than the other. And um, I, I think this, this kind of speaks to um, the difficulty of rollups just taking these shortcuts through a centralized sequencer in providing the users better UX. And now it's, it's going to be very hard to either move away from that UX or um, decentralize it. So how do we recreate privacy in, in a decentralized way? So um, one is maybe you still have centralized block builders, but at least these centralized block builders are competing with each other in a, in a sort of competitive market, right? But the downside here is that these builders all have different, they all have their own, own unique form of trust. And so as a user or as a blockchain, you need to decide which builder do you trust, which builder do you not trust. And this really in, risks enshrining some builders over others. And it also creates a big incentive for vertical integration between different supply chain participants, because you're always more willing to trust yourself than you are willing to trust someone else. And so this option, I would argue, is a very centralized one. Second one is, again, the aforementioned committee-based solutions like threshold encryption um, or first come for serve. These might also work together. And then option three, which is having one homomorphic. So I mentioned the second one because this is basically a way of privacy in, in easy mode, if you will, because it's much easier to uh, stand under the idea of an encrypted mempool or a, any system really where um, uh, audio back. Okay. Um, any, any system really, um, where different parties share the same type of privacy, where if you trust the, the privacy zone, then you can also trust everyone within it. And so, um, for example, what this would mean, you, you send, uh, an encrypted transaction to, to a mempool and you know, it's going to be kept private, no matter who interacts with it going forward. And so this is. What we're working on, um, the Suave, but it's also super hard. Then you have cross-domain AVV. Uh, just when you think you're out, they pull you back in. Um, even if you have competition between these centralized builders, you still have the problem of cross-domain AVV. The builder market is already naturally very centralizing um, due to um, economies of scale. Um, uh, uh, but layer twos, uh, just because of their existence, they make the problem even worse because the more fragmentation, the more domains there are, the more fragmented liquidity and, and trading volume is, the more cross-domain there will be. And this creates a strong centralizing pressure on the builder role through demand for atomic transactions. And then finally, there is latency. This I would put in the same category as, as privacy. So roll-ups, um, they all wanted to have, or at least at top Arbitrum, and they wanted to have, um, based, um, sequencing originally, but then, um, it turned out that users liked faster confirmation so much that they have had to switch to a centralized sequencer with faster pre-confirmations. Um, and this lower latency, this is a big friction with decentralization. We need geographical decentralization for neutrality and decentralization and, and other things. But for that, we need our systems to be insensitive to latency. Um, and if you lower the block time too much, then what you get is you encourage vertical integration, geographical integration between proposers and block builders, and you discourage participation from anyone who is not able to vertically integrate, who is not able to co-locate in that same geographical area. And so that's why PBS is essential, but it's not enough. We also need to look into decentralizing the builder role itself. So that's what we're trying to do with Suave. Um, 
there are other proposals as well. So, but the idea is building the best MEV auction and making it decentralized, um, because that's, that's what allows us to do the heavy lifting on ordering for these other chains. Removing all elements of trust in flashbots and searchers and block builders from the system, making it private so that participants have the ability to trust the auction and trust others and don't have this need to vertically integrate um, with others in the supply chain. And making it scalable, um, because by connecting many different domains, um, we allow for the expression of cross-domain preferences as well. So John Chabonet, our host, uh, has this great um, diagram here that actually shows the roll-up transaction supply chain in the future, uh, possibly. And um, it shows that the sequencer really becomes the proposer, right? And you can have proposers that that basically sequence many chains, but you still need the block builder. And because you you have these centralizing effects on the block builder, you also need the block builder to be decentralized. So in the roll-up endgame, we're going to need all three. We're going to need the decentralized sequencer. We're going to need the decentralized builder, and we're going to need the private mempool. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not going to work out. And um, dear roll-ups, please make MEV a more central element of your decentralization roadmaps. Remember, sequencer equals proposer plus builder. Don't ignore the last part. We need to decentralize both. So come reach uh, reach out to us uh, to learn more about Swarth and come to our forum, um, collective.flashbots.net. Um, that's it from me. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, happy to, to take any questions.